You're now listening to an archive episode of Or So I Thought, back when the podcast went by a different name. I really hope you enjoy it, and please make sure to listen to our new stuff. So after you're done here, just scroll up, pick a new episode, and press play. I'm sure you're familiar with the name Zappos, the company that sells shoes online. But did you know that Tony Shea, its founder, first became a millionaire through a business that he started out of boredom? You see, Tony was working at a tech company and the job was boring. So on his extended two-hour lunch breaks he would take every day, he started a website where blog owners could trade links to each other's sites. Very meta, I know, I know. Well, this idea took off. And this business that Tony Shea started during his lunch break eventually became his full-time work. And then shortly thereafter, it sold to Microsoft for $265 million, way back in 1999. Makes me kind of question how I spend my lunch breaks. Today, this is what we're going to talk about. How a little side project can become our main job if we play things right. And we're going to use a story of someone who made one of my favorite web documentaries of all time. My name's Kirby Ferguson. I am a filmmaker, a video producer, and a speaker. Kirby is best known for his series of documentaries called Everything is a Remix. It's super fun and interesting because it takes some of our favorite things, like the iPhone, Star Wars movies, rock songs, and it uncovers how those things weren't really that original. And it shows us who they copied and remixed. His thesis? Nothing is original. Everything is a remix. The videos have over 8 million views combined on Vimeo and YouTube. His career is interesting because it just kind of happened by accident. And it's a perfect example of someone turning work that they did out of curiosity and passion into a lucrative solo career. Here's how this is going to go. At first, we'll hear from Kirby how the idea for Everything is a Remix first surfaced. Then we'll see how the success of that project turned into his business, his work. And then we'll use his story to extract tips on how one should balance the work once we've turned a passion into an occupation. Kirby graduated with a writing degree, but writing work was difficult to come by, and he soon realized that his self-taught graphic design skills could keep the bills paid until the writing took off. He became a full-time graphic designer at a firm, but like many of us, he had hobbies outside of work. Basically, I, I made funny short films before doing that, so my idea was I wanted to try something that was longer. Um, so doing something that was episodic was a way to kind of break something up and make it longer and make it more manageable for me to do it. I wanted to take the comedy out for the most part and just see what happened because I felt like comedy, like having to deliver jokes in rapid succession was, was limiting. <clears throat> and I wanted to take myself out of it. I was in the, the early videos that I was doing before this. They're basically like every, they, were, they were kind of like an earlier version of Everything is Remix, but I was in them, like sort of a video blog sort of style. It was a video blog. And he didn't have to go too far to find a topic. For those of us who are constantly nervous, what am I going to do next? Or I need a big idea. I have no ideas. Pay attention to this. The ideas are already there. Check out how Corby found his muse. I started because I wanted to answer the question for myself. It was just a topic that I, <clears throat> it was a question that I wanted answered. And it was something that, you know, had, had been in my life for a long time. Like I, I felt not original for a, a lot of my life. So it was sort of a, an issue with me that I, I wanted to grapple with, I guess. And it was very, you know, of the moment, in, in that moment in time, it was culturally reaching some sort of pinnacle. And again, I'd like to emphasize, it didn't start as some big, huge idea. It started like most other productive things. Very small. For me, often I come up with individual small ideas. Um, like the way that Everything is Remix started, I remember, was I basically, like there's breakdowns in it of like Led Zeppelin and Star Wars and, and the Mac. Um, and Quentin Tarantino 
And I had those ideas first. I thought it would be interesting just to do little videos that are just breakdowns of, of those people, just show, like just showing like, hey, here's where this stuff came from. And it wouldn't, there'd be nothing more to it than that. It would just be brief videos that, uh, that break down these, these films and these artists. But then I realized like, hey, I, I could potentially tell a story with these bits rather than it just being, you know, a series of disconnected bits. So that was how that one came about. And I, I find that's, that's a, it, it's certainly not a rule, but that's a common thing with me. I, I get a series of smaller ideas that I can join together into one uh, larger idea. So I, I'm always, you know, hanging on to ideas. I keep you know, I keep good notes for my ideas and, you know, I hang on to them and I review them occasionally. Um, and then often out of that kind of mess of, of, of ideas, you know, a few things will, will come together and something will, will, will start to snowball. And did he anticipate this becoming his job and being so successful? No, not at all. <laughs> it was, no, I started it for fun. I started because I was interested in it. But as soon as he finished it, something about it felt oh so right. No, it, it definitely, there was a definite like instant zing to it, you know, very quickly within 24 hours or whatever. You know, I, I knew that I had something. Yeah, it was fast. And the timing definitely helped. This was back in 2010. So you got to remember what the internet was like back then. No, it was blogs at the time. It was still, you know, now things are, I mean, it, it was the start of the Twitter era, I think, you know, social media was, was happening at that point. Um, but yeah, it was mostly blogs and Vimeo. And, and Vimeo. It, it got a fairly good fit, foothold on Vimeo. It got featured on Vimeo and um, became popular on there. And then it was actually blocked on YouTube <laughs> originally, the, the, the first video, because it had, you know, of, it's full of copyrighted stuff, of course. Um, so it, it, it got a good foothold on, uh, on Vimeo as well. And with the first video being so successful, was there pressure now? Was it difficult to continue producing the episodes? No, honestly, there weren't. Um, and I say that because I'm a person who's had tough spots since then, but Everything is Remixed was not. It was a fairly small, it seemed really big and ambitious to me at the time. In retrospect, it, it feels fairly small and manageable. The first episode got made pretty quickly. I, I would guess it got made in a month, but it had been bouncing around in my brain for maybe probably a couple of years before that. Um, So it had been percolating a while, but the first video took maybe a month, maybe six weeks or something like that, which, which for me is very quick. Um, and then the video, and then they took longer and longer. Um, but I was doing other stuff in between and the videos were getting more ambitious in, in how they were produced. Um, but I never got stalled really. There was an eight month gap between the third one and the fourth one, but I did a bunch of speaking engagements in there. I, I think I produced one or two other videos, so there was a bunch of other stuff going on. Lots of things going on. That's a good thing. When your hobby starts to deliver value to others, now things start moving for you. That's what the next section is about. You're rolling now. Your little side project got some eyeballs on it. It's become a calling card. People like your work. People want to see more of it. People now want to pay you to help them make similar work. This business model goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Mozart's steady income came as a composer for the emperor's court, and he also tutored wealthy children. Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel as work commissioned by the Pope. And it's another way to capitalize on, on that effort that I put into these independent projects as well, which usually like they don't sometimes like they don't pay very well, sometimes they don't pay at all. Um, sometimes they're, they're just about visibility, you know, it's about, you know, number one, doing something interesting that I want to see done, but also hoping that, you know, it, people are, are interested in it. Um, so when I do the commission work, you know, the, this, you know, all that effort and experimentation and whatever that went into doing the experimental projects, I can pay that off. I can get compensated, uh, to some degree with the, um, with the commissions, you know, for what I learned in the uh in the independent projects because they're the independent projects tend to be this is how it works for most of the world they're not you're not going to get rich off your independent projects uh if they can not lose money you're, you're doing pretty pretty great i think um so you have to you know for for independent artists you have to find other ways and and commission work is another way to to capitalize on you know um skills that i developed doing my own stuff that's the point i want to highlight your hobbies and independent projects Those are for skill building, for turning pro. The commissioned work, that's where you get to really extract value from the skills. 
Is commission work ever a skill builder? Not really, honestly, because it, it more it more goes the other direction. Like I get the commission work based on the independent projects that I do. So the things that I learn, the new techniques that I that I develop, the new ideas that I come up with, they come from that world. And then the commission work is usually people who want to do something that that sort of has that feel or is thematically related or something like that. So most of the transfer has gone the other way from the independent projects to the to the commissions. The commissions have certainly I don't know, the commissions are just a very different experience of like like you're on a deadline generally, a fairly tight de- deadline usually. It's, you know, usually a maximum of a couple months or whatever that you have to to do something. So it's much you have to be a lot more pragmatic. You can't experiment as much. You have to, you know, get it done in fairly short order whereas with uh, my own personal videos, I'm trying to make the the prime goal is just to make it as good as I can make it. And there are constraints on that. Like, it's not just, you know, I'll take whatever amount of time to do it. You know, I do it, believe it or not, I do it as fast as I can, even though it takes a bunch of months to make a video. But I do a bunch of other stuff, and they're really freaking hard. They're really freaking hard to pull together. Yeah, I, I do the, I, I make them as quickly as I can make them within the, with, with the resources that I, that I have available um, and keeping in mind that the project is very large and it's, it's hard to pull off. Um, so there definitely, you know, there definitely is a strong interest in getting it done, you know, as, as soon as I can, but at the same time, you know, I'll, I'll take a little extra time if I have to, 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 to make it good. So yeah, for, for, for me, they're just very different, um, experiences, but, but mostly the, the transfer of skills and knowledge goes from the independent projects to the commissions. But. The skill building should never stop. Remember, this is what got you here in the first place. By this point, maybe you can leave your 9-to-5 job and live off of commissioned work, plus any little bonuses from the independent work. Now the time dynamic has shifted a little bit. For Kirby, he takes on commission projects, but he's also working on his ambitious new project called This Is Not A Conspiracy Theory. It's taken him a couple of years to produce the first three of five episodes because now he essentially has to earn his free time to devote to this new project. I know how this sounds, but this is a good problem to have. There, there have been times where I've gotten big, big projects and then I've been able to just take the next few months off and not off, I, I'm, but to dedicate the next few months just to working on, this is not a conspiracy theory, generally producing the videos. That that's where I need the most dedicated time. When I'm researching and writing, I'm, I'm better able to, to work on other stuff at the same time. But once I'm in video production, I sort of need to just stick with it. Um, so I've, I've had those fortunate periods where, you know, I did a big commission and then I, you know, had a period of time after that where I could just dedicate myself to it. And then, but a lot of the other times I'm juggling and plenty of other times, like right now it's just evenings and weekends that I'm on. This is not a conspiracy theory. And most of the week I'm, I'm working on um, commission stuff. So it's kind of all over the place. Yeah. It varies from, from evenings and weekends to all week. And I, I don't know that there's much regularity to it. But I, I would say that overall it's probably 60, 40 uh, in favor of doing commission work. That'd be my guess, yeah. 60-40 is not a bad split at all. Imagine if you had the luxury of spending 40% of your time on your dream project. If we could all get there, I think we'd see a lot more smiles in the world on a Monday morning. But it all starts with us. Let's see how we can maintain a healthy relationship with the work once we're rolling on our passion projects. Once we've become better at getting to work on our passion projects, and once we have some interest in our services as a hired gun, it's easy to lose valuable time because we have too many different things going on. So how do we manage the switching back and forth? How can we keep the scale at some sort of balance without losing momentum? I think you're, you're definitely going to have ideas brewing at the same time, um, just because brains don't aren't that linear you know you're not going to you know entirely dedicate yourself to one thing and then move on to the next thing like creative minds just aren't that tidy you know things don't just don't work like that but i do think that like once you are actually producing something i think it's good to keep it as streamlined as you possibly can like i do know that with with this is not a conspiracy theory when i have to switch over to other projects 
it takes a while to like remap your brain to, to do something else. Like once you've been working on something for a while, um, you know, you, you create, you know, I, 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 I don't know how to explain it, but there, you know, it, it kind of gets hardwired into your brain um, and your brain gets better at, at, at doing that kind of work. And then when you switch to another kind of work, then it takes a while to like ramp up again to, to, to get adapted to that kind of work. And then it takes a while to get uh, reacquainted once you switch back to the original project that you were working on. So for me, I personally, like once you're actually working on something and you can have like little ideas brewing on the side and you're capturing ideas and, and logging them and all that stuff. But I generally think it's a good idea just to, to stick with one thing uh, and finish it if you can. So you're still going to be having ideas during that period, but I, I personally wouldn't develop them. That's just me. Maybe other people are different, but um, I, I find it hard to switch back and forth. I, I think the same thing, the way that you know, multitasking supposedly works, this has been you know, tested in, in a variety of ways. There is some scientific literature to support it, that it slows you down. Like multitasking actually slows you down because you, you take a hit, every time you switch between these little tasks. And I think maybe, I don't have science for this part, but for me it feels like that applies in, in, in the big picture as well. Like if you're switching between doing one large project and then you switch to doing, to doing some other sort of medium or small project or whatever, you lose a lot of momentum in, in that switch of, of going over. So that's me. Um, you know, Don't know if it applies to other people, but that, that's been my experience. This all goes back to a major benefit of passion projects, and that is that they teach us a lot about ourselves. We get to know our little quirks, we learn what we like, what we don't like, and most importantly, we figure out our work style. You, you have to push yourself, but also kind of accept what you are. Like, like the fact is, I've never, been, I've never been a sprinter when it comes to like work energy. Like even when I think back to when I was like really young and, and, and I had, you know, a lot of energy, I was never like that, you know? Like I remember when I had day jobs, when five o'clock rolled around, you know, I'd be done because I was fatigued from, from you know, going all day long because that wasn't my, my natural rhythm. Um, so yeah, you have to, um, you have to kind of accept your nature and work with it and you can make it better you know you, you can you can work on it to to improve it you, know, you can eat better you can exercise more all those things help um but you do have to kind of accept what you are and i, I think when it comes to um that sort of energy i think that i think people just kind of have it or, or they don't to to a great degree like some people don't sleep barely you know listen that's a huge advantage for get, getting stuff done like they don't sleep very much i have to sleep you know nine hours or or, or whatever it is um so i do think that y your energy level to a great degree I, I think is is kind of um is what it is and you have to you have to work with it and even when you've stayed true to your temperament things will be rolling and you'll reach a point where your work becomes bigger than you this is where kirby stands now i asked him what's next I'm at the point where I'd like to not be doing so much of the video production myself. I'd like to be more of a director, you know, to have collaborators, you know, get good people who, whose work I like and, and just sort of set them loose to, to, to do what they want. And, and I could help, you know, sort of make the pieces coherent and, and unify the style and all that and provide the, the original material. But let, let my collaborators make it more basically trying to narrow the boundaries of, of what the work is that I do, because it's at the point now where it's so broad what I do and so time consuming that there's just no further that I can go in that direction. Like I can't, I can't have my skills get even more broad than they are now because it's all, you know, things are already, you know, getting quite slow to, to produce at this point. So I would try to narrow my contributions uh, a bit and become, become more collaborative so I would hope to be more of a director in, in five years, maybe. It's also possible that I could just try something totally different after this. I, I don't know. But basically, I pursued the route that I'm on as, as far as I can go with it. Like, the idea with this not a conspiracy theory was to, to push the, the, the skills that I was developing with, with Everything is a Remix as far as I could possibly push them. And I've done that. Like, I can't go any further. I can't go any further without getting more money or more people. Um, th those are the things that could, where I could go further with it. So I, I could be interested in those routes if they came up, or I, I might be interested in trying things that are smaller and, and quicker um, to, to produce. This is a great situation to be in, when our projects become big enough to feed ourselves and some team members. 
Almost every great company, almost every great piece of art started as a little idea that wasn't sustainable until it was. And I argue that none of us is too far from this. It all starts with a little bit of effort during evenings and weekends. The effort slowly becomes a calling card for paid work. And this calling card can one day become just simply our calling. You can find me at thisisnotaconspiracytheory.com and everythingisremix.info. Uh, Everything is Remix. We had a video about The Force Awakens came out two or three months ago. That's the most recent thing you can see from me there. This is not a conspiracy theory. Episode four, which is a big 20 minute, super ambitious, you know, really exciting uh, video, should be coming out in the near future. I won't say when because I'm, you know, who knows. Um, but I'm definitely you know, way, way deep into it, and it, it's coming out in the near future. It's super exciting, and yeah, you can find that series at thisisnotaconspiracytheory.com. The project book is supported by FreshBooks. Here's the thing. I can spend hours and hours producing podcasts and enjoy every second. But when it comes to invoicing, I can't bear to do it for more than a minute. With FreshBooks, it only takes me 30 seconds to create a professional-looking invoice so I can get back to doing what I love to do, podcasting. FreshBooks even gives your clients tons of ways to pay online by card, so no more waiting for the proverbial check in the mail. Go to freshbooks.com project to get a free 30-day trial. That's freshbooks.com slash project. And write project book in the how did you hear about us section. You've been listening to The Project Book. You can learn more at theprojectbook.net. My name is Alex Cespedes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>